السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, My fellow pediatric dentists, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen On behalf of the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry I'd like to welcome everyone This is Dr. Maram Al-Aqla a, a senior registrar pediatric dentist at the Ministry of Health I'd like to thank the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry for their invitation I'll be your moderator for today's session. As you know, the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry is a nonprofit organization founded in 2016, and they arrange a monthly webinar. And in today's agenda, we have interesting topics to discuss and exciting speakers. Our first topic would be anomalies of size, number, and shape. And I'm pleased to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Rawan al Khwesim. Um, presenting the topic anomalies of size, shape, and number. So Dr. Rawan is a senior registrar pediatric dentist at Al Amiris Dental Speciality Center, Kuwait. In 2014, Dr. Rawan obtained her Bachelor of Dental Surgery degree from the School of Dentistry, Liverpool, United Kingdom. And in 2019, Dr. Rawan obtained her Doctor in Dentistry, Pediatric Dentistry Speciality, University College London, United Kingdom. Welcome, Dr. Rawan. Screen is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Maram, for this introduction. I hope that my screen is clear now. Can you see it? Yes, clear. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's my honor to be presenting today with the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry. My topic today will be about anomalies of size, number, and shape. We're going to talk about gemination, fusions, macrodont, and supernumerary teeth. Our overall webinar aims today are to introduce practitioners to several key aspects of anomalies of size, number, and shape, and to highlight and emphasize the role of pediatric specialists in the diagnosis of these dental anomalies, and of course, instill confidence and enthusiasm about managing these dental anomalies. And the objectives of today's webinar is to recognize anomalies of size, number, and shape, understanding terminology, etiology, prevalence, clinical features, and management of these anomalies, and to discuss the pediatric, pediatric dentist's role in managing these cases. As we all know, Tooth development can be influenced by genetic factors, environmental factors, or idiopathic. Developmental disturbances often appears as uh, number and size, shape and form, structures, eruption, or exfoliation. When you encounter a patient with dental anomaly, always remind yourself to ask these key questions. Take a thorough history. Ask if there is anyone else in the family have anything like this. Are all of the teeth affected in a similar manner? Always take a history of, the, of birth, pregnancy, and any major incidents in the first three years of the child's life. And when it comes to examining the child clinically, Look if there is chronological distribution to the appearance scenes. Look at the splings, parents, if they are affected as well. And it's always, always uh, important to remind yourself that you may not always come to a definite diagnosis immediately. In order uh, to, uh, in order, it's more convenient, sorry, to consider the dental anomalies by the developmental stage at which they arise. So, in the dental lamina, formation stage, induction, and proliferation, we can encounter anomalies of numbers as hyperodontia, hyperodontia, double teeth, odontomes. And if the insults happened on the morphodifferentiation stage, this is, this is the stage where abnormalities of size and shape occurs, such as macrodontia, microdontia, invagination, evaginated teeth, and accessory cusp. So this is the outline of today's presentation. We're gonna touch a little bit 
in anomalies of number, hypodontia and supernumerary teeth, moving to uh, dental disturbance of size, microdontia and macrodontia, and then finishing with anomalies of shape, fusion, gemination, dense and dense, dense invagination, talon cusp, pterodontism, dilaceration, and concrescence. So, anomalies of number. Hypodontia. What is hypodontia? Hypodontia is the general term used when you encounter reduced number of teeth. It is one of the most common dental genetic anomalies. And if you find a child with one up to six missing teeth, then the correct term to use for the case is hypodontia. However, is the, if the number of teeth are more than six missing teeth, then the correct term should be oligodontia. And if you encounter a child with completely absent dentition, then anodontia is the correct term to be used. Hybridontia can affect both primary and permanent dentition. And studies have shown that if there is an abnormality of number in primary dentition, then there is a 40% chance of numerical abnormality in the permanent dentition as well. This is some uh, pictures uh, to illustrate uh, the different term of hybridontia. So in the first picture here, we can see one missing uh, tooth, which is the lat upper lateral incisor, and the correct term to use is hypodontia. The middle picture in here, where we have more than six teeth missing, which we called it oligodontia. And the last picture is anodontia, where we cannot see any tooth in the mouth. Epidemiology of hypodontia. Permanent teeth are more commonly affected. However, you can see hypodontia in primary dentition. The prevalence is around 0.1 to 0.9%, but in the permanent dentition is more, ranging from 3.5 to 6.5%, with an equal female to male ratio. The most common tooth to be missing is the third molar. Then, comes the lower second premolars, upper lateral incisors, upper second premolars with the least lower central incisors, uh, least common uh, tooth. Etiology of hypodontia is multifactorial. However, genetics considered to have a key role. As we all know, tooth development is a complex process involving multiple genes which are also implicated in development of craniofacial structures and structures of ectodermal origin. Any mutations of these genes can therefore have wider effects, and as a result, hypotonsia may occur as a feature of several syndromes. So we can have non-syndromic hypodontia or association with a syndrome like ectodermal dysplasia, orofacial digital syndromes with oral clefting, Down syndromes, and others. Other causes of hypodontia, such as radiation, chemotherapy, trauma, thalidomide, rupella, tooth bud gouging in primary dentition. How do you diagnose hypodontia? After thorough uh, history and examination, Always remember family history important as well. Look and pay attention to other aspects like hair, skin, nails. Ask about any syndromes uh, in the family, not only with a child himself. And when it comes to hypodontia cases, there are several aspects to be considered. Patient factors, dental factors, anatomical factors. Patient factors patient oral hygiene or oral health, motivation, and the age of the child is really, really important. Dental factor, position, and quality of the teeth present. Uh, anatomical factors like the skeletal pattern and soft tissue profile, any bony anatomy, and position of vital structures. So, management principles as a pediatric dentist. In the early years, as a pediatric dentist, we have a crucial role to play in educating 
not only the patient, but also their parents. At this time, appropriate support and advice will lay the foundation for a good oral health oral health so that the primary dentition is maintained for as long as possible as this has been shown to have functional benefits and it is important to ensure that in childhood preventative regimes are initiated and when the patients are in, mix, in primary and mixed dentition treatment should be kept minimal and depending only on the patient concern it may be possible to avoid restorative intervention at this stage. We don't really want to exhaust them too early. Older children tend to become more conscious of their appearance and peer pressure, and hence the demand for treatment increases, and also compliance for extensive dental treatments may also improve. Usually the management of these cases is by a multidisciplinary approach, either by restoring spaces orthodontically or with, uh, with prosthodontic colleagues, uh, using RRBs, partial dentures, over dentures, depending on the case and number of teeth missing. So we want sometimes to restore the form and aesthetic with composite fillings as well. And if there is uh, infra occluded teeth, we want to manage these uh, infra occluded teeth as well. And our aim is to maintain a static and function until we can provide definitive treatment when they are older around 18 years old. So moving to the next part, supernumerary teeth or hyperdontia. Supernumerary or hyperdontia is development of an increased number of teeth, which is referred as hyperdontia. It is the result from continued proliferation of permanent or primary dental lamina to form third tooth germ. The additional teeth are referred to as supernumerary teeth or as a dollar sign. Etiology, mostly unknown, but possible genetic link as well. You can see extra teeth in, uh, in all quadrants actually of the jaw. They can be unilateral, bilateral, single tooth or multiple extra teeth, erupted or impacted teeth, the condition which are commonly associated with supernumerary teeth, such as cleft lip and palate uh, cases, cranial dysplasia and Gardner syndromes. These are some x-rays and uh, clinical pictures. Prevalence supernumerary teeth are present in approximately 0 0.2 to 0.9%, in primary dentition and uh, 1.5 to 3.5 in permanent dentition with 2 to 1 female male ratio and 5 to 1 maxilla and man, uh, to mandible. Also, studies have shown if there is primary uh, supernumerary tooth, then there is a chance of 50% that the permanent dentition will have, will have a supernumerary tooth as well. How do we classify supernumerary teeth? Supernumerary teeth can be classified based on morphology, location, position, and orientation. In this slide, we can have location, as in mesiodens or uh, anterior maxilla, paramolar, distomolar, and parapremolar. Morphology or shape, conical shape, tuberculate, supplemental or odontomes, orientation, vertical or normal, inverted or horizontal, and position, puckle, palatal, or uh, transverse. So I found this nice table uh, from a paper on diagnosis and management of supernumerary teeth by Professor Shah Ashish from the Eastman Dental Hospital. Uh, as you can see here, different types of supernumerary conical, tuberculate, supplemental, and odontomes with its relative occurrence, with the conical shape being 75% more common in the anterior maxilla, and uh, with a typical radiographic appearance of each type. So classification of supernumerary teeth, 
based on shape and variation in location. In these radiographs, we can see here uh, the conical shape between the central incisors, supplemental shape, which looks identical to premolar, and tuperculate on this third radiograph. And based on location, as you all see here, between the central incisor and mesiodense, parapremolar in the premolar region, and paramolar, usually around the seven and eight, and distal uh, molar. There is a study by Rajab and Hamdan, 2002, which was a review of literature relating to supernumerary teeth presented along with a survey of 152 cases. The study population consisted of 152 children who visited the Department of Pediatric Dentistry at the Jordan University Hospital. Patients ranged age from five to 15 years with supernumeraries were detected by clinical examination and radiographs. So the results came as 77% of these cases had one, at least one supernumerary tooth, 18% had two supernumerary teeth, 5% had three or more, and 93% uh, were predominating in the central maxilla area and 75% of these supernumerary were conical in shape, and they have found that conical shaped supernumerary had a significantly higher rate of eruption compared to the tuberculate shape. So, classification based on location, mesiodense. As I said earlier, it's the most common supernumerary tooth. It is located in the maxillary midline, and can be conically shaped, tuberculate, or supplemental. These cases are more usually seen as a single tooth, but uncommonly as a pair of extra teeth on the palatal side of the crowns of the upper central incisors. They are usually found on routine radiographic examination with no clinical signs or symptoms with the more commonly conical shape. However, when permanent incisor eruption is delayed, this should ring a bell when you can see sometimes a tuberculate uh, supernumerary tooth delaying the uh, eruption of the central incisors. They can also sometimes interfere with position of primary centrals following their eruption if they are in, uh, erupted, even causing early loss of the primary incisors. Paramolar, they are the second most common supernumerary tooth. Position beside and between molar teeth in either the maxilla or the mandible. The shape of these uh, teeth is very similar to the normal dentition and most commonly like uh, premolars. While removal of paramolars is usually encouraged, their potential has been uh, suggested to replace severely destroyed molars, uh, sevens or sixes. They are usually found uh, as well on routine dental radiographic, uh, incidentally. Distal molar, a distal molar supernumerary tooth located distal to a third molar and is usually rudimentary. It rarely delays the eruption of the associated teeth. Parapremolar, these forms in the premolar region and resemble a premolar shape. What are the complications that are associated with supernumerary teeth? The most common one is the prevention or delay of eruption of the associated permanent teeth, displacement or rotation of permanent teeth, crowding, incomplete space closure during orthodontic treatment, the laceration, delayed or abnormal root development of associated permanent teeth, root resorption of adjacent teeth, which could lead to loss of tooth vitality. 
how do you diagnose uh, supernumerary or how do you uh, come to this uh, diagnosis? Usually, you will notice unilateral persistence of a deciduous incisor, failure of eruption or ectopic eruption of permanent incisor, a wide diastema, rotation of erupted permanent incisors. These all should alert you that there are possible presence of supernumerary teeth, which will require further investigation, such as dental panoramic uh, PAs to use upper standards occlusal, and uh, sometimes compium CT is important as well. Consideration when it comes to managing supernumerary cases, age of the child or the patient, is the supernumerary erupted or unerupted? Is it interfering with eruption of the permanent teeth? Is it inverted? What about the location of it? Is it associated with any pathology? Is the child going to have orthodontic treatment and this is interfering with, with orthodontic movement or not? Usually, surgical removal of these supernumerary teeth is the treatment of choice when it's interfering with eruption or if the child needs ortho treatment. The child age will dictate the appropriate time for surgical intervention, avoiding unwanted damage to the immature permanent teeth crown and root. If the timing of the surgical intervention is appropriate, then the unerupted permanent teeth may erupt without orthodontic traction. However, if surgical intervention is delayed and permanent incisor root is nearly mature, then traction will normally be required. And if you encounter a case of a su supplemental supernumerary uh, erupt, uh, which erupts, then a decision will be need uh, will need to be made sorry whether to extract the supernumerary supplemental tooth or the normal tooth this decision will be influenced by which extraction will give the best orthodontic result at the end so you need to work close by with your orthodontic colleague in these cases the british orthodontic guidelines suggest that the presence of supernumerary teeth and odontomes does not really necessarily cause delayed eruption of incisors. However, tubercolate supernumerary teeth are more likely to cause the obstruction than the conical supernumerary teeth. And if there is an obst obstruction, it should be removed. And they found that in 54 to 78% of supernumerary teeth removal, the incisors should erupt spontaneously within an average time of 16 to 18 months. However, the incisor may also be exposed at the same time as the supernumerary tooth is removed if you've been asked by your orthodontic colleague as well. So moving to the uh, middle part of this presentation, which is anomalies of size, teeth size, the normal size of teeth has been standardized and a certain range is accepted among population. When the proportions are reduced or increased as compared to normal, the condition can be classified as follows. Macrodontia, when the tooth size is larger than normal range, which is too big, we call it megadont or macrodont. Microdontia, when the tooth size is a smaller than the normal range, too small or microdont. Anomalies of size, megadont, the first part. In general, maxillary central incisors are, as we all know, nine millimeter wide, while maxillary lateral incisors are 7.5 millimeter wide. Any size above these figures are considered enlarged or macrodont. So we have teeth that are larger than normal variation, but have exactly normal morphology and usually affects are common on the centrals and they are bilaterals. It affects 1% of population, mainly permanent teeth. 
and sometimes you get confused with anomaly of pore and often seen in association with hyperdontia with supernumerary cases. There is correlation and there is a study we're going to talk about at the end of the presentation. So macrodontia can be three types, true generalized macrodontia, relative generalized macrodontia, focal or localized macrodontia. True generalized macrodontia, when we have a case of all teeth larger than normal, and if you come to the medical history, usually these patients will have vegetary gigantism, and this case is exceedingly rare, to be honest. Relative generalized macrodontia, when we have normal or slightly larger than normal teeth in a very small jaws in association micrognathia. So it's as a result, uh, it's results, sorry, in crowding of teeth and insufficient arch spaces. Focal or localized macrodontia, uncommon condition with unknown etiology, the tooth may appear normal in every respect except for its size and shouldn't be confused with a fusion of teeth. So only a single tooth in the mouth that is larger than normal. How do we manage uh, these cases? Main issues are whether they have one root or two roots. If there is two roots, how far they are fused? Are we able to separate? How large is it? Are the long term or are there any long term orthodontic implication? In these cases, taking a compound CT is very important. If the condition is mild, then we can accept it and the child can live with it. We can leave it as it is and keep monitoring. May be possible to reduce some width when with trimming. The problem are is the teeth are wide as well cervically. In some cases. You may think of separation, separate. If it's large, then we can extract after discussion with our orthodontist and, uh, as I said earlier, interdisciplinary approach. So the second part is microdont or microdontia, when we have teeth that are a no uh, smaller than a normal variation. They are normal. For, they have normal form or tapered form. Prevalence is 0.5 to 2.5% uh, in population, with females more than males, and usually seen in maxillary lateral incisors, as we call them, peg laterals. And uh, they are the clear examples of reduced size or macrodontia. And there is a strong association with hypodontia cases and microdontia. Again, it can be divided to three types, true generalized microdontia, relative generalized microdontia, focal or localized macrodontia. True generalized microdontia, when we have all teeth, are smaller than normal. It occurs in some cases of pituitary dwarfism, and it is exceedingly rare as well, where teeth are well formed, uh, but are very small. Relative generalized microdontia, normal or slightly smaller than normal teeth. They are present in jaws that are somewhat larger than normal. Macrognathia, they are illusion of true microdontia with a role of hereditary factors involved in here. Focal localized microdontia, this is the common condition where we have common forms of localized microdontia is that which affects maxillary lateral incisor, the peg lateral. So instead of having parallel uh, or, of, or diverging mesial and distal surfaces, the sides converge or taper towards or together incisally, form a cone-shaped crown with the roots frequently shorter than usual, and the basic structure and composition of the tooth are unchanged. Management of these cases, of course, aesthetic, dramatically affected. After a thorough discussion with the child and their parents, 
discuss, discussing the different option, depending on the child age compliance. Uh, you can leave, extract, you can think of composite buildups, restorations at an early age with ceramic or composite laminate veneers is treatment of choice usually, with full por porcelain veneers or crowns being an option in severe cases. In some cases, you may uh, need an overdentures as well. So it depends on the case and different factors in each case. The last part of today's presentation is anomalies of shape. So anomalies of shape. Incidence and prevalence of malformation differ between races and ethnic groups. Many malformed teeth are associated with syndromes and malformation can be classified according to shape as either fusion, gemination, accessory cusp, dense evagination or dense and dense, pterodontism, the laceration and concrescence. Double teeth. So the term double tooth has been used to refer to a form of a developmental abnormality of size where a tooth is abnormally large. There is wide variation in appearance from minor notch to two separate crowns and usually affects incisors, can be seen in primary and permanent dentition with an equal male to female uh, ratio. 30 to 50% of cases in primary teeth have anomalies in permanent dentition as well. There is various definition and causes. And to be honest, you are unlikely to make a definitive diagnosis when the patient presents with a double tooth. So fusion. Fused teeth arise through union of two normally separated tooth germs with a complete or partial fusion between the dentine and enamel of the two separate teeth. This may occur between two teeth of the normal dentition, or if you're unlucky, between one tooth of the normal dentition and a supernumerary tooth. A true fusion between two teeth of the normal dentition, the, normal, the number of the teeth in the arch is usually reduced. If there is a supernumerary aspect uh, in the case, then you can't really relate to the sentence. Depending on the stage of development of teeth, a fusion may be complete or incomplete. If this contact occurs early, at least before calcification begins, then the two teeth may be completely united to form a single larger tooth and they are more common in deciduous than permanent dentition. And there is hereditary tendency in these cases. The clinical significance are aesthetic and periodontal diseases in some cases. Gemination is when we have incomplete attempt of tooth germ to divide into two. The cleft usually involves the full crown length with an appearance of two teeth clinically. Trauma has been suggested as a possible cause, and the co but the other causes still unknown. Tooth count in gemination cases are normal. There was a study introduced, uh, which introduced the classification of the different types of geminated teeth based on their morphology clinically with type one being divided the crown with a single root where the crown is usually oversized with incisal notch and associated with a pulp chamber of two horns. And the overall size of the, the root and pulp is normal. Type two, when we have both the crown and root sizes increased with no notch or groove, and a single large pulp chamber and pulp canal as well. Type three, when we have conjoined crowns uh, are cervical and with a vertical groove and two pulp chambers merging to a common single nerve trunk in a larger than normal root canal. 
type four, when we have two identifiable crowns and roots and are attached with a groove throughout the entire length of the two. I know it's a bit confusing. So fusion and germination, it says are relatively easy to be distinguished and probably diagnosed if there are no supernumerary elements involved. However, with supernumerary elements involved, as I said earlier, the original description of either a reduced number of teeth in the arch with one tooth being larger in fusion cases or increased number of teeth in the arch with one large cliftic tooth, gemination does not follow. Some clinicians prefer to call all larger teeth double teeth and then to describe accurately by a clinical and radiographic examination the coronal, radicular, and the pulpal morphology, morphology separately. How do we manage uh, double teeth? We need, first of all, full assessment, including the malocclusion, the crown width, the root morphology, the extent of the fusion, in cases you really need to take compim CT, to be honest, there is no uh, published protocol on the management of double teeth. There is a paper uh, with a suggested protocol by Professor Paul Ashley from the Eastman Dental Hospital on management of double teeth in children and adolescents, where they suggested a protocol of management of these cases. I've attached the protocol in here for you to see later on. To be honest, the, the suggested protocol in managing double tooth is established based on a well-motivated child when there is bilateral presentation which, with each double tooth needs to be assessed separately. And this protocol must not be, uh, no, must be noted that the above protocol is a guide, it's not a guide for treatment. As, as I said earlier, every case is different. Accessory cusp, supplemental cusp, or uh, as we all uh, know, cusp of carapelli is the most common example of accessory cusp with prevalence of 17.4 to 19% uh, in white population. It is located on the palatal surface of the mesolingual cusp of a maxillary molar. And as we all know, it does not contain pulp and there is limited to no clinical significance of this accessory cusp and usually no treatment uh, required. Moving to dense evaginatus, which is an outer growth of enamel with or without dentine, ranging from a small eminence to a full cusp. It can be seen in any tooth, it's like a protrusion from the occlusal posterior tooth or lingual anterior uh, tooth. This can be unsightly or cause occlusal interference. It can fracture off easily in some cases and to expose a pulp as it contains pulp. And then the child can present with a tooth as a non-vital soon after eruption can be seen both in primary and permanent dentition may be involved and the invagination may be bilateral as well. There is a variety of terms used for dense evaginatus, such as talon cusps. And as I said earlier, it contains pulp. It has a high incidence in the Asian and Caucasian population with Asian population prevalence one to 4%. Etiology uncertain, there is genetic and environmental aspects in here. It affects maxillary primary lateral incisors, permanent laterals and centrals also likely to be affected. Posterior dentition, usually bilateral and mandibular premolars are most commonly affected. With anterior dentition, lateral incisors are most commonly affected as well. And radiograph, Dense evaginatus cases. In radiographic images, the talon cusp appears as a radio opaque structure overlying a normal 
anatomy. The pulp portion of a talon may be visible and superimposed on normal pulp horns. In larger evaginated masses, the pulp is more easily visible, so care must be taken to correctly diagnose talon cusps on unerupted teeth and thereby avoid unnecessary surgical intervention. Classification based on size and shape was introduced by Hattab et al. in 1996. They classify the talon cusp to three types, type one being an extra cusp on the palatal or labial surface of a primary or permanent tooth at half its clinical height. Type two or semi-talon, when we have an extra cusp of more than one millimeter, but less than half of the clinical crown, this excess part is either isolated or conjoined with the palatal surface of the tooth. Type three, trace talon, which is a large cingulum with different shapes of conical, bifid, or tubercle-like projections. How do we manage these cases? There is higher potential for caries development in the deep grooves at the junction of the talon cusp and the involved teeth. In some cases, you may do nothing. It's important to fissure seal or, uh, or use adhesive restoration in grooves uh, in some cases. In some cases, we may uh, need to gradually grind down the cusp avoiding any pulpal involvement. And then a fluoride therapy can reduce the sensitivity after coronal or occlusal adjustment. In some cases, we might perform a shfak or partial pulpotomy and this tooth may lose vitality. And in some cases, you may uh, need orthodontic treatment to tilt the tooth. And in severe cases, we may need to extract the tooth so multidisciplinary management is needed in these cases as well. Moving to invaginated teeth now, invagination is an ingrowth of enamel with or without dentine from the occlusal surface toward the pulp space. It's also known as dense and dense. The folding is extreme and produces the radiographic image of an inverted tooth inside the involved tooth, like a tooth within a tooth. Disturbance of formation causing small bits or grossly dilated crown. In more severe cases, invagination may leave a path to the pulp, leading to early pulpal necrosis after eruption. It has been reported in both dentition with permanent teeth most affected. It's usually seen on the lingual, again, lingual aspect of upper incisor teeth and more commonly on the lateral incisors. Again, etiology is unclear. Prevalence varies from 1.5 to 10%. So, uh, invaginated teeth can be classified into three types. Ahlers in 1957 classified invaginated teeth into type 1, type 2, and type 3, with type 1 being invagination confined to the crown but not extending beyond the cementoenamel junction. Type 2, invagination invading the root as a pliant sac, which is below the CEJ and may connect to the pulp as well as you can see in the middle radiograph. Type three is when the invagination, this is a severe type, invagination through root to apical region. And usually there is no communication with the pulp. Invaginated teeth management. Again, accurate diagnosis is essential to inform correct treatment. Pulpal involvement in these cases is common. Negotiation of canals often requires an operating microscope. So you might need to work in close by with your endodontist colleague in these cases. Most of the involved teeth develop pulpitis and pulp involvement as the enamel and dentine that lines the enfolded area is very thin 
and easily preached by early caries. Dense invagination in general and dense in denty cases are seen more frequently, as I said earlier, in the upper lateral incisor and less frequently in molar region. So, patient may present to your practice with pain and abscess or done vital tooth with no history of trauma. So you need to check other incisors for invagination. You need to check palatal grooves. Again, it's a multidisciplinary management uh, cases. In mild cases for type one, fissure sealant of the groove and monitoring vitality may be an option. Type two and three, you may consider extraction. You need to liaise with orthodontist and endodontist uh, colleague. Torodontism. Usually, multi-rooted teeth where body and pulp is enlarged at the expense of the roots. You have an elongated crown, as you can see in the radiograph, and apically placed root furcation in molars. This anomaly is detected in radiographs usually and seen in both dentition, but is commoner or more common in the permanent dentition with 6.3% of mandibular molars affected. It can be classified into three types, hypotorodont or the mild type, mesotorodont, moderate, and hypertorodont, which is the severe type. It's usually associated with many conditions and syndromes, such as Down syndrome, hypophosphatemia, dentinogenesis imperfecta, associated with OI and vitamin D resistance. Radiographic features of torodont rectangular in shape, the pulp chamber usually large with lack constriction, roots are exceedingly short with bifurcation or trifurcation. How do we manage these cases? Usually, no treatment required. Pulp treatment of such teeth is difficult. If they require endodontic treatment, always refer. The laceration is the name given to those teeth with bends or changes in the long axis of their crowns or crown roots or roots. Causes, usually following trauma, to the developing tooth bud, intrusion of the overlying primary predecessor, or idiopathic. The severity of the laceration is dictated by severity of the original trauma, and the lacerated teeth may not erupt normally. Again, a decision will need to be made whether the tooth is viable or not. Concrescence. This is the case in which two independent adjacent teeth are pathologically connected at their root surfaces by cementum after for root formation is complete. Usually they are due to crowding or trauma. They are more commonly present in posterior maxillary teeth where we have development pattern involving second molar tooth where roots are in close proximity to the third molar tooth the clinical significance usually during tooth uh, extraction difficulty. These are some pictures illustrating the aforementioned uh, different anomalies of shape. And these how they appear on the dental radiographs. So there is a controlled study of associated dental anomalies by Pachiti in 1998. So if you encounter a, a case where they have any of the dental anomalies, always look what's next, because they have found that there is significant association between hypodontia of second premolars, microdontia of maxillary lateral incisors, infraocclusion of primary molars, enamel hyperplasia, and palatal displacement of maxillary canine. And again, another study of a model for etiology of anomalies of tooth number and size in humans by Pro et al. in 2002, where they have measured the teeth on study models. 
they have found that patients with hypodontia usually have smaller teeth than controlled cases. And in patients with supernumerary teeth, they have larger mesiodistal incisor teeth than controlled and they have increased taper. What are the considerations in the management of dental anomalies? So, informing and supporting the child and parents is crucial. Establishing a correct diagnosis is important. In some cases, you may need genetic counseling. You may be, well, uh, be the first who detects something in the family. It's interdisciplinary formulation of a definitive treatment plan. Always remember to eliminate any pain. In some cases, for the child, own confidence, you might restore for aesthetic. You want to provide adequate function. We want to maintain occlusal vertical dimension and use of intermediate restoration in childhood and adolescence and prepare this child for the future. And then planning for a definitive treatment at an optimal age. Treatment planning for children with dental anomalies. Although children will cope with a range of appliances and treatment during childhood, early adolescence represent period of social adjustment as well as transition changes, transitional changes in the dentition. So it is perhaps the most difficult time in which uh, to formulate a long-term plan. That's why we always say we don't really want to exhaust these cases too early. Teenagers are most concerned and have compliance and they think about their aesthetics, yet it may be too early as well to provide definitive restoration. So extensive orthodontic treatment may be required or later orthognathic surgery, depending on each case. It is essential to seek advice from your colleagues in managing these children with uncommon dental condition. Local and international collaboration provide best opportunities and increase our knowledge and improve the outcome for these children. If you are lucky and you work in an institute, then in institution you have the team approach or the multidisciplinary approach with various team exist to treatment plan and manage these cases from pediatric dentist, orthodontist, prosthodontist, surgeon, in some cases, a speech pathologist and clinical psychologist. We have here a psychology part in these cases as well. In summary, dental anomalies may have both a functional and psychosocial impact on the child and their family. The presence of one dental anomaly may be associated with others, Thorough clinical examination and radiographic investigations are crucial and essential. An anomaly in primary dentition may be associated with a similar anomaly in permanent dentition. And as a dental professionals, we have an important part to play in the diagnosis and care of these children with these conditions. Always remember multidisciplinary care is needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rowan. Very refreshing topic. Nice presentation, nice illustrations. Uh, Thank you very I'd much. Like to invite, I'd like to invite the audience to send their questions on the chat box. Uh, if the time allows, we'll try to answer all of your questions, which all Dr. Rowan can. And if the time, due to time limitation, we can, if you can send them to the society and we'll make sure to forward them to Dr. Rowan. Uh, so, Dr. Rawan, um, I face a lot of situations in the clinic with children of supernumerary teeth, and the teeth are not causing any complications, and they're not likely to interfere with orthodontic tooth movement. So, what do you suggest? How should, how long, um, how often should be monitored the teeth with um, the supernumerary teeth, not causing any complications, and not likely to interfere with orthodontic treatment? 
uh, what do you suggest, doctor? So, uh, Dr. Maram. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, if the teeth are not causing any complication and they're not yeah. likely to, co to interfere with orthodontic treatment, as you said, mm -hmm. then uh, studies have shown that monitoring yearly radiographically uh, these cases should be okay. However, if the you should really warn the patient of any complication that is associated with leaving the supernumerary tooth. Okay. If in the future that could cause any uh, cystic changes or migration or damage to the nearby uh, roots, but yeah. if they are not causing a uh, delayed eruption and they're not really causing any problem, just keep on monitoring and reviewing yearly with radiograph. Okay, great, clear. Uh, one of the audience is asking what is the proper time for extraction of a major dent? Well, it depends on the case, depends on the scenario, depends on the situation. We cannot really always say. As I said earlier in my presentation, you need to look at the uh, root formation as well of the uh, permanent incisors. Okay. Yes, I think in my practice, what I've observed is uh, as soon as they affect the eruption of the permanent teeth, uh, yes, if there is a delayed eruption, exactly. Yeah. yeah, they present to the clinic due to this reason, actually. Mostly complaining from delayed eruption. Complaining from delayed eruption, eruption. Yeah. Yes. yeah. If they're causing delayed eruption as a consequence, then you can early uh, remove these uh, mesiodents in order to allow the permanent uh, teeth to uh, erupt. Yes. Uh, Dr. Rawan, I, I, uh, I want to discuss this case with you. I had one patient with a uh, macrodontia in their molars, and they presented to me with badly decayed uh, molars, and they needed stainless steel crowns. Uh, however, we could not fit any stainless steel crowns due to the size, as you know. So mm -hmm. from, your, yeah, from your experience, what do you suggest for these patients? How old was the patient, and Eight were they permanent or primary teeth? Primary teeth. A primary teeth. Yes. And you've used the, uh, you couldn't really uh, place stainless steel crowns. Yes, because they are too, too small. Too small. Well, yes. usually stainless steel crowns are always the option. However, in these cases, yes. you need to explain to the parents exactly what's the situation. If you want really to save these teeth using like composite buildups, maybe, but warn the patient that it won't last, as we all know not like yeah. the crowns and yeah. just a matter of time until the permanent uh, successor comes through yes i actually emphasize the prevention of caries itself mm -hmm. due to the limitation of the treatment options that we have so i suggested that they uh prevention that. Is key, to be honest in these cases mm -hmm. yes these parents yeah. sometimes are not really aware yes. so they need help okay yeah that's what i thought too Thank you, Dr. Rawan. Pleasure. Uh, on behalf of the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry, we'd like to express our appreciation and we're so pleased to have you. Thank you very much. It's an honor, honor to be honest. No, we're Tina. Inshallah, I'm sure. Thank you, Dr. Rawan. Thank you. Okay. Uh, would like to move on to the second topic, pediatric oral medicine, and like to welcome our second speaker, Dr. Ahmed Al Gahtani. Dr. Ahmed Al Gahtani uh, obtained his Bachelor of Dental Surgery in 2012 from King Khalid University, Abha, Saudi Arabia. In 2017, Dr. Ahmed obtained his Master's in Science of Dentistry from Case Western Reserve University, Cleveland, USA. In 2019, Dr. Ahmed obtained his oral medicine residency certificate from the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, USA. In 2021, Dr. Ahmed became a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Medicine. Currently, Dr. Ahmed is an assistant professor of oral medicine at Jazan University, Saudi Arabia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ahmed. 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهلين دكتورة مرام وأسعد الله مساكم جميعا أسعد الله مساكم شكرا دكتور مرام شكرا بيدياتريك دينتستري the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry for uh, inviting me to present the pediatric uh, oral medicine uh, Today, inshallah, I'm going to talk about the uh, oral medicine cases, the most common cases in uh, pediatric. Uh, just give me a second. Um, okay, so today, um, inshallah, um, uh, I will talk about a brief introduction on uh, about the, the examination, taking history from patients, then the most common uh, oral mucosal lesions that we uh, see in oral medicine uh, clinic, and also uh, the most common cases that you see in pediatric uh, uh, clinic or pediatric dentistry clinic, even the general uh, dentist as well. Uh, Timbromandibular joint uh, disorder and the cerebral gland uh, disorder as well. So uh, uh, as a pediatric dentist, our general dentist, you are the first station for the parents and for the child uh, when the child has any problems like any oral mucosal or any non-dental or non-periodontal disease because they don't have more information about other specialty and dental uh, specialties. So you're going to be the pediatric. Uh, so you're going to be the first station. Uh, that's why you should have some experience on how to diagnose and how to uh, like have some knowledge about these cases. Um, some of these lesions uh, resolve by itself, and some need some intervention. But the 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 problem is that some the approach to uh, management to these cases and the dental care may be different. Uh, uh, because of different etiology of these conditions and also the ability of the child to accept the uh, standard uh, treatment. So uh, it's good and it's recommended to have your questions direct, directed to the child. Uh, ask the child the questions, uh, especially the children above the age of four years. They can communicate, they understand with, their support, uh, with the support of their parents. But keep in mind, don't interpret the, their word like exactly what they say or uh, literally. For example, if they say swelling, if they say uh, ulcers, if they say uh, uh, any description, you have to confirm. You have to ask them, what do you mean by ulcers? What do you mean by swelling? Uh, and if there is, uh, just ask before you do the examination. Uh, I think you, you all have the experience with this uh, child, with the children. If there's any sort in the area that you're going to examine um, because you, you do want to aggravate the pain uh, especially if they have ulcers or severe pain with these lesions uh, but all lesions that you see in the patient mouth you have to uh, record it you have to write down the size the color the shape the consistency the location every details and some of the literature they recommend to take a pictures to keep evaluating the uh, the cases so uh, we, uh, I will start talking about the common oral mucosal lesions in children. There's like a huge number of cases, but we will talk about uh, some of the common. And uh, before I talk about this, let's see this uh, scoping review, uh, which is published by the uh, the oral medicine uh, after the world uh, workshop oral medicine about the frequency of oral mucosal lesions in uh, children. So they include uh, 20 uh, clinical studies which has a huge number of uh, sample like more than 85,000 and 34 studies which has biopsy results or biopsy uh, from, uh, from the biopsy surfaces which has like more than uh, 40,000 uh, biopsies so uh, the result of that that as you see in this table the top six of the uh, oral lesions or in the clinical studies it was like after ulcer and the uh, herpes uh, uh, lesions, uh, trauma associated to lesions, uh, geographic tongue and candida infection, and also ulcers in general, without make more specific about what type of ulcers. Regarding the uh, biopsy, you see at the top of the list, like 70%, 17%, uh, it's a mucosid. 
this is another study uh, has like 10 years uh, experience. Uh, they see the, the uh, it's retrospective study about the oral mucosal lesions in children uh, uh, from like the newborn uh, kids until the 12 years old. Uh, more than 10,000 children were enrolled and they found that the uh, oral mucosal lesions uh, frequency in these uh, children is about like 29 percent. Um, also, they found that uh, most of these lesions uh, are in the patient or the child, they have systemic disease. It could be because the, uh, the illness itself could be because of the medication they use to treat these uh, problems. Maybe they have like anxiety, stress because of the illnesses. Uh, but they did not mention it in this study, but they found the patient with more chronic disease had higher oral lesions more than the healthy children. The most frequent lesions, almost the same of the lesions that I mentioned in the previous study, uh, oral candidiasis at the top of the list, geographic tongue, uh, traumatic lesions, uh, aptus ulcer, uh, viral infection, and also less than 1% of uh, erythema multiform cases. So uh, based on this uh, study and also based on what we encounter or what we see in the in oral medicine clinic, uh, I summarize uh, the most top of uh, like type of these lesions. I will start with oral ulceration. First one is the traumatic ulcer. Traumatic ulcers it's encountered and seen in children and also in adults. Uh, but usually we see these traumatic ulcers in non-keratinized mucosal surfaces the surfaces or the mucosa that they, they like doesn't have bone under it like the buccal mucosa labial mucosa uh, tongue and once you see this traumatic ulceration like at the beginning of uh, uh, forming this uh, ulcers you will see like a degree of erythema uh, around these lesions but as this uh, ulcers become like a chronic uh, it's becoming like uh, white borders. I will show you a picture next slide. Uh, but usually we see these uh, traumatic ulcers uh, close to the occlusal line or uh, close to the teeth because of the, uh, for example, you see it on the cheek. So, so the patient is uh, keep traumatizing and cheek biting and also lower lip or our upper lip as well. Uh, sharp lower incisor uh, mammalians for the newborn, uh, like for the new teething uh, child. And the management for these cases, as you see, we have to first eliminate the cause and you will see the uh, improvement uh, after like uh, maybe two weeks, three weeks. So in this slide, you see this uh, kids with the uh, ulceration at the ventral side of the tongue. Uh, so because of the uh, sharp tooth, because of the mammalian as well so they smoothen these uh, sharp edges and you can see you can see the result for weeks after it's almost uh, healed uh, this is another example of this 13, uh, 13 years old with the traumatic ulcers uh, uh, so he has this ulcer uh, it's reported in this uh, case report he has the lower teeth it's tilted like lingually it keeps traumatizing his uh, uh, ventral side of the tongue and the other case, the, the case here, uh, the patient who has like tooth extraction two days ago and he keeps biting his lips and he developed this uh, uh, ulcer as well. So the key point, uh, before I say that, you can tell here, this is a chronic ulceration. There is a white hyperkeratosis around it. Uh, you can see it on uh, cases with a chronic ulceration. The key point with the traumatic ulcers, because you do need to do it like further investigation, we have to take a good uh, history of the lesions. Uh, this is another like interesting cases of uh, traumatic ulcers, but it's a factitious ulcers. What does it mean? It's the self-induced uh, 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 self-induced oral uh, mucosal uh, ulcers caused by the patient him or herself. Uh, so the patient traumatizing himself maybe it's intentionally or intentionally many factors attributed to causing these ulcers emotional psychological disturbance uh, maybe you can see it in the children who have stress in uh, unstructured families child live with with the dad or mom uh, divorced parents homeless uh, abused uh, like sexually or physically abused victims uh, drug addict as well uh, so the factitious ulcers 
in non-syndromic individuals could be intentional or unintentional. What I uh, say, what does mean non-syndromic? Because we can see this practices ourselves in patients who had like cerebral palsy, who has mental retardation, autism, uh, but uh, healthy uh, kids has no syndromes. They may have intentional because they have some psychological or emotional disturbance. So they're traumatizing themselves to uh, get attention or to seek help from others. Uh, also, they may uh, traumatize themselves unintentionally. They have stress in their life, regardless what is the cause. And so they keep doing a bottom functional habit, keep biting their teeth, biting their cheeks, uh, doing some body functional habit unintentionally. Some of the music, uh, their nails traumatizing their uh, gum as well. So this case, the, the top case here, you can see the patient. It's, uh, this is seven years old uh, uh, girl. She is biting uh, frequently her buccal mucosa and she used her nails scratching the upper right vestibule as well. The, this case here, down here, it's for uh, uh, 17 years old. She has problems with her family. They're expecting her to finish the high school, starting uh, like uh, university and a prestigious and uh, more competitive uh, uh, like school. She is more stressed. She, she is anxious. So she tried to fake it. She used the carpet dye. Uh, I, and you can see her skin, the lifted cheek outside her mouth. She use it here to make it looks like it's inflamed and she keeps traumatizing her uh, mouth like her uh, by using her fingers the problem with this we have to uh, make a, take a good uh, history because if you do not diagnose it as a factitious ulcers you will keep doing uh, uh, like lab testing you will do an unnecessary imaging for these cases uh, so this is harmful for the kids and he has nothing. He has no systemic disease, no problems. Just we misdiagnose these cases. That's why I mentioned it here. Uh, but there's some point or some tips that may help you uh, with these legions. Usually a typical presentation. Yeah, it doesn't look like, like a typical uh, systemic disorder. Uh, and when you take the history from the patient, he has like poor or incomplete history and usually did not respond to appropriate therapy. For example, this case here, they give her 80 uh, milligram of prednisone and, he, and she came back like two weeks after nothing changed, which is unusual if, if it's autoimmune disease or they biopsy it and they make like a diagnosis of benthicus vulgaris at the beginning, but it's not the usual presentation for the benthicus vulgaris because it's like unilateral affecting only one side. The second part of the oral ulceration is recurrent after stomatitis. And I think most of you have seen these cases in your uh, practice. We have minor, major, and uh, herpetic form type of uh, after ulcer, different names of after ulcer canker sores. Uh, it's recurrent, comes and goes. Uh, usually it's uh, like, uh, has a, like a red halo around it. And you can see it here uh, as well with the herpetic form. Uh, this table kind of summarizing uh, these three types of uh, after systematitis and the major changes uh, in the number and the size of these uh, ulcers. Uh, so the, the major, it's larger than the minor. Uh, the herpetic form is affecting girls more than boys and the herpetic form can affect the gum, non-keratinized. Uh, the, the keratinized tissue, but the major and the minor usually affecting non-keratinized tissue and it takes more time uh, uh, to heal, like more than 30 days. So what is the predisposing factor? What is the cause of this recurrent after stomatitis? Um, the first cause, local factor, trauma, uh, mastication, uh, tooth brushing, uh, after dental appointment, the, some patients they may develop uh, after this ulcer, uh, drugs, medication, like beta blockers, uh, NSAID, non steroidal, uh, like ibuprofen, uh, like any different type of medication. Uh, food hypersensitivity, some patients are sensitive from the chocolates, from the uh, uh, cereals, uh, peanut butter. Uh, for the genetic predisposition, uh, predisposition uh, if, if both parents have uh, aftus ulcer, if both parents have aftus ulcer, most likely, like more than 90%, their kids will have uh, after ulcer. 
And there is other type. It looks like aphthous ulcer, but it's aphthous like ulcer. What does it mean? It's aphthous ulcer associated with systemic or nutritional or immune deficiency. Systemic disorder like patient with celiac disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, Bacteria disease, uh, patient with chronic anemia, any different type of anemia, immune deficiency, like, like for example, patient have cyclic neutropenia. Management of these cases, um, uh, before we start with the management, uh, overall, of this ulcer, it looks like the same thing with an adult, children and adults. Diagnosis, uh, causative factor, the disposing factor, it's the same. And you have to make the patient understand this is recurrent. It may come and go. It takes like a week or two weeks and it will come back again. Depends on the cause. But you have to take a thorough medical history and review of system. When I mentioned patient has, for example, Crohn's disease or any GI problems, you ask the patient this question, do you have any like constipation, diarrhea, bleeding in your stool, and also you have like bloating, abdominal pain, like frequent, not only with like one meal and they have problems, no, we have it more frequently. Uh, for example, if, uh, if you suspect like Bacteria disease, you ask the patient, you have any like any uh, eye lesion, you have skin lesion, genital area lesions, like any uh, frequent, how often you have these uh, ulcers in your mouth. After we make a, like a good medical history, like a good review of system, uh, we have the first management, it's we control and manage the predisposing factor. And also the patient have, for example, anemia, we control it, uh, and also refer a patient to uh, other specialty if you suspect any other problems. Uh, using the steroid for this recurrent after stomatitis is just to control the symptoms. It's not uh, treating the after completely and not coming back again. No, usually it's controlling the pain and decreasing the period of time. It's either that, like not taking two weeks, it will take like one week, one week and a half. Uh, cortisone, topical cortisone is the treatment of choice for this, uh, uh, but there's no study evaluating the safety using the cortisone in children. But in literature, it's recommended you can use low or medium potency, like try amcinolone for a short period of time. After this ulcer, usually it takes two weeks. So if the patient used the cortisone for two weeks, it's totally safe based on what uh, mentioned or what reported in, in the literature. So the other parts of oral mucosal lesions, it's non-dental uh, infection. Non-dental infection, including the, like I will start with the viral infection. Viral infection, it's uh, uh, primary gingival stomatitis or herpetic gingival stomatitis. It's oral or perioral infection of the herpes, simplex virus. Uh, it's the first infection because there's a recurrent. Uh, typically or usually, it's affecting kids between six months to five years. But we can see cases in like maybe 60 years old. Um, it's transmitted uh, mainly by uh, contacting the infected oral secretions or lesions. For example, if the mom has like herpes labialis here, and she using the like spoon and give it to her child, the transmission will be, uh, the virus will be transmitted. Or if you give like a direct kiss to the kids uh, and you are infected, you will uh, transmit the virus to the uh, kids. And uh, it's usually affecting the children and the teenagers as well. Uh, once the child affected, uh, like infected, um, there are some prodromal symptoms. Uh, so the child will feel like there's some fever, high temperature, uh, loss of appetite, uh, they feel like sore throat, difficulty swallowing, uh, they feel some nausea, they have some swelling of the lymph node on this mandibular uh, uh, they like lymphoadenopathy. So after a few days of these uh, signs and symptoms, you may see erythema, like clustering maybe on the lips or inside the mouth. Then physicals, it's affecting both uh, mucosa, like keratinized and non-keratinized. And it's characterized by acute marginal gingivitis. If you see it, it's like ulceration on the attached uh, gingiva. These physicals, after a few days, it will rupture or burst to form ulcers. So the patient will feel like it's, it's, it's really painful, causing difficulty of eating and dysphagia, or uh, some cases, odinophagia, uh, like pharyngitis patients feel painful swallowing. This is uh, what you see uh, most of the cases, like typical cases, you'll see it like this, affecting the, 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 the tongue, buccal mucosa, gingiva, and also the lips as well. 
and uh, like very oral as well, the skin around the, uh, the mouth. So how do we manage these cases? The good things about this viral infection, it's self-limiting. It takes like a few days, up to 14 days, then it will disappear. But some mild cases, we have the main, like the main treatment is we keep the patients hydrated. You keep the child hydrated uh, because once they have like so much pain in their mouth, if they cannot swallow uh, or they feel pain and uh, with swallowing, they will keep avoiding or refusing uh, fear of, uh, like foods. So it may uh, getting worse to get to the hospital or hospitalization. So the first thing is to keep the patient hydrated. Um, you may give the patient ice chops like uh, on uh, a soft diet like yogurt with rice, uh, avoid like chips or something to like uh, all the uh, spicy food. You may use acetaminophen like uh, Benadol or ibuprofen. Uh, in literature, it's the topical anesthesia, getting like topical lidocaine or intraorally. There is uh, no sufficient like evidence to use it, and they and they recommend against using this topical anesthesia. Uh, so you can use Benadol only. Uh, also for the lips, if it's uh, affected, you can use like uh, Vaseline or the uh, barrier cream to keep or to prevent the lips from like adhesion to each other. Um, the question is, do we use the antiviral medication? Um, if the patient has this lesion, if, it, if the patient comes to your clinic within like two days or three days of starting this physicals or this prodrome, you can start the patient with a cyclophyr and the dose is 50 milligram per kilogram for five, uh, five times a day for five to seven days. Some literature they mentioned and like for uh, 10 days, that will help like uh, increase or accelerate the uh, heal, uh, healing. Many symptoms like reducing fever, uh, controlling the symptoms like the lesions and decrease the viral shedding. Because as you know, after the first infection of this virus, the virus will uh, stay like latent on the ganglion, usually it's the trigeminal the ganglion, then we will keep having the herpes labialis like in our life as an adult. So using the antiviral at the beginning will reduce this uh, viral uh, shedding. Uh, for, uh, this is for immunocompetent patients who are not immunocompromised, but immunocompromised patients, it's different, uh, different uh, management you should have antiviral medication even the patient comes to you like five days, six days, uh, six days after. The other infection is the fungal infection. Uh, it said that the candida infection affecting the very young, like the children, young children, the very old, the old people, and patient who has dry mouth and very sick. So if you have case like an adult, like an uh, adult, no systemic disease, no dry mouth, less likely, less likely it's uh, the lesion they have in their mouth. If they see any lesion, it's candida infection. So it's common superficial fungal infection affecting children. They may have oral thrush, especially the, uh, the young children. And also it may be erythematous candidiasis, like what they have at the corner of the mouth, the angular uh, colitis. Uh, most of the causes of the, and the clinical presentation looks the same thing as we see in adults. So the oral thrush, we can see it on uh, young children if they have, like, if their immune system is compromised because if they, they are sick or they have nutritional deficiency. And the same thing with, with adults. Uh, if they use antibiotic uh, therapy or inhaled uh, steroids. So if the patient, for, have, for example, have, like, uh, some allergy and they use uh, inhaled steroid, you may see uh, all a thrush. Um, for cases of angular colitis, we see these cases usually for the kids who um, have chronic lip uh, licking, like using their tongue against their lips uh, and our lips uh, sucking. Um, the diagnosis is usually cl uh, clinical. We don't need to do any tests. For some cases, if you want to compare your diagnosis, uh, you may do like you may do like swab, um, like gram stain to confirm your diagnosis. Some cases, it's patient is asymptomatic, but some kids, they uh, look like fuzzy. Um, they do not tolerate any food or any drinks. Uh, they feel some discomfort. The management of these cases, the first line treatment is using topical nice static. So we use the, you take a gauze with this topical like ointment or gel and uh, use it on the corner of the mouth. Um, but if the patient is old enough, 
to have uh, like to drink or to use like the uh, nice statin suspension it's good to help the, the patient swish and if they can spit or swallow the uh, nice statin but be careful with the nice statin be, uh, because it has uh, saccharose like uh, sugar on it so if the patient use the nice statin it's four times a day they keep using four times a day with this uh, uh, sugar on it it may have like increased risk of dental cares. So after using the nice statin, advise the patient to swish with water and uh, spit. Um, after the patient has all this lesion disappeared, the patient needs to continue, or the parents should use continue this uh, antifungal medication uh, more like more uh, for uh, two more days to decrease the recurrence and. The same thing which we have on uh, denture stomatitis. On all people, we treat the patient and the, like the denture itself. Here, we should treat the patient and also the pacifier or the bottle enabled. Um, it's recommended to have it like in, uh, uh, by boiling uh, before each use. And also keep in mind, if you keep the patient using this medication, Isatin, patient uh, does not need to eat or drink five to 10 minutes after. Some other medication, uh, myconazole, uh, ointment, it's not if they are approved for children. Uh, fluconazole, it's a good option to use, but usually we save this to to, uh, to be used if the nice statin uh, doesn't work. Patient comes back to you in uh, maybe one week and uh, still have this fungal infection, so you may switch the patient to fluconazole. And also we use it for usually for uh, immunocompromised patients. But be careful with the uh, uh, adverse effects, not not the adverse effect with the contraindication of other medication, especially if the patient use any other medication. Uh, the other non-infectious conditions is the geographic kind, and I think most of you know that uh, it's benign migratory glossitis uh, and stomatitis because it's affecting uh, not only the tongue, also the uh, other part of oral mucosa. It's a benign, uh, chronic inflammatory conditions of unclear etiology. No one knows what is the cause of this uh, geographic tongue. Uh, period of remission and exacerbation. For example, this case, as you see on the left side here, patient comes to the clinic with this with this uh, geographic tongue, looks like this. Then after 30 days, it's totally different. It, if you see this patient, you will see like it's maybe totally different patient. So it has period of remission and exacerbation. Uh, and also the location, the size, the shape, uh, it's, it's changed with time. The diagnosis is made clinically, so you don't need to do any biopsy or any other investigation. Um, so it's self-limiting, asymptomatic, uh, less than 5% five, uh, five of uh, people, they are symptomatic, even adults, they are symptomatic, they are sensitive, they feel uh, some sensitivity or burning sensation, especially if they eat or drink like acidic or spicy, salty food, so first of all, you have to assure the patients it's benign. No cases ever reported to have like malignancy, uh, malignancy transformation of this lesion. Um, ask the patient if they are more sensitive to avoid these foods uh, if they, when they are uh, uh, symptomatic. Uh, using topical steroids, analgesic, or using antihistamine, switch and spit, uh, there's no unsufficient evidence to support, especially in kids but we can use this uh, medication on uh, adults. Um, uh, in literature, it's say it's this geographic tongue associated with uh, tongue uh, with the fissure tongue. We see many cases, patient has geographic tongue and fissure tongue, and also uh, psoriasis on the skin, sodafia, and atopic uh, dermatitis. And some of the uh, authors, they report this is oral psoriasis, like sodafia til fem. The other part of my lecture today, inshallah, I will talk about the temporomandibular joint uh, disorder. We switch from the oral mucosal lesions to the uh, temporomandibular joint. So diagnosis of this uh, lesion, uh, of the uh, temporomandibular joint, of this pain, uh, the same thing with adults, because they have the same anatomy, the same muscle of mastication, joint, everything. So if you have a patient in your clinic and the patient maybe come back to you again and again, they complain about toothache pain on their tooth and you, when you examine the patient the patient doesn't have any like any dental or very dental problems especially if they have the pain on the upper right or left or like close to the masseter muscle area and you didn't see any cause of the pain like no cares no very dental problems 
like think about team B, do examination of timbro mandibular joint. Um, the etiology, the same thing of the adults, but in kids, uh, the key factor almost the anxiety. They have maybe they may have problems at the school. Sometimes they have like illness in their family or problems at home. Uh, Tumor mandibular joint disorder, it's a collective terms of several clinical signs and symptoms. It includes like pain or problems in the joints itself, or maybe the disc, the meniscus between the condyle and the, uh, the, uh, at the joint, and also the muscle of mastication. Some patients, they have only problems at the muscle of mastication. Some of them have inflammation or a pain at the joint with the disc. Some of them, they have only muscle mastication and disc displacement without pain at the joint itself. It's different from patient to patient. But we see these cases in kids, especially like increasing with age. Um, there's one, there was one study done by Dr. Nelson in 2009 uh, for kids uh, aged 16 to 19. They found that uh, more than 32% of girls compared to 9% of boys we have about uh, school absence, uh, school absence, and also using analgesic or relieving pain because of TMB uh, related pain. So, uh, what are the causes? What is the etiology of uh, TMD or tumor mandibular joint disorder? Uh, macro trauma, like patient has a history of falling or car accident, they fall on the like in the floor or on the uh, stairs, they have injury to their face. Uh, or physical abuse, it's not necessary to have like all the signs and symptoms right after the uh, accident. Some of patients, they have it years ago and all the signs, symptoms start like maybe nine, ten, five years ago, uh, five years after. So just ask about the history. Even if you have adult like 19 years old, do you have any problems or any accident or fall or anything years ago? The other part is microtrauma, part of functional habit. As you see in this uh, pictures here, uh, attrition because of the proxies grinding their teeth, clenching. Uh, you can see here a marks of the teeth, lower teeth, uh, crenation on the tongue because the patient is stressed and keep pushing their tongue uh, against their teeth. So this is some signs uh, can like tell you, even if, if, if the patient does not tell you that, this is some signs tell you about micro trauma. Uh, psychosocial factors, uh, kids with the stress and anxiety, is kids with the uh, bipolar, kids with the uh, uh, obsessive compulsive, uh, also with the systemic or pathological factors. Kids who have rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lobus, the belhamra, or juvenile idiopathic uh, arthritis. Uh, uh, some are like some of the uh, other special like orthodontists. They ask about. Uh, treatment of the TMJ, uh, especially for the kids who have uh, some, like they need auto treatment. So in literature, the uh, development of TMJ is not caused or improved by auto treatment. And uh, it's not supported in any literature. So some patient, they ask, uh, I have some TMJ, TMJ problem. Do you recommend me to do any auto treatment? Uh, you can do it, but it's not as a treatment for TM TMJ problems. So how do we diagnose this in kids? Um, the same thing we do in adult comprehensive evaluation. Uh, we take a good history, asking about any trauma or any history of a parafunctional habit. Uh, we do clinical examination. When you do a physical examination, we have to do a comprehensive examination to the muscle of mastication, to the joint, uh, uh, to mandibular function, to ask the patient to open a close. We will go through it now. So first of all, you come behind the patient. Sorry, I did not find any examination uh, pictures for kids, but it's the same thing. You come behind the patient and put your uh, fingers in front of the ear and ask the patient to open and close. You will put the lateral capsule of the TMJ. Um, ask the patient to open their mouth widely and close, open and close. Uh, also ask the patient to move the jaw forward and move the jaw also laterally, lateral movement right and left. When you come behind the patient and you see like the tip of the nose with the chin and you, when the patient open and close, you can notice if there is any uh, abnormality in the range of movements. Maybe there's some diffusion or deflection. If the patient open, you can see like shifting to the right, shifting to the left, 
or maybe some deflection. The patient opens, go to the right, or open and goes to uh, the left. The range of opening, if you have a ruler, the normal uh, measurement from the tip of lower incisor to the tip of the upper incisor range 35 to 55 millimeter. But if you don't have ruler in your clinic, you may ask the patient, not your fingers, because the patient have like a smaller mouth opening and put the three fingers in the mouth to see if it's three fingers, it's almost like a normal opening. Some patients, they have limited mouth opening. They cannot open even like uh, but, uh, two fingers. Uh, palpation of muscle of mastication, we palpate all the four pairs of muscle of mastication, temporalis muscle, masseter muscle, uh, intraorally during the lateral media trigoids. You can do it indirectly by resisting the patient's mouth uh, opening, lateral movement as well. Make pressure on these muscles, ask the patient, do you feel any pain? And you have to ask the patient and confirm, is it pain or pressure? Because some patients, or especially the kids, if you want to put pressure, they feel like it's painful. It's not pain, it's just pressure. But some patients, yes, they have uh, pain when you palpate the muscle of mastication. So the treatment options, the treatment options for the uh, timbromandibular joint, especially for kids, uh, start, we start with the patient education. If there is any barofunctional habits, and also educate the, their parents, if there's any barofunctional habit, like nail bitings, uh, using any object like they use pen to uh, like chewing or biting on it. Uh, also, ask the patient to keep in mind the normal position of the teeth is not touching each other, touching each other only when they eat or when they talk. But at the wrist uh, position, there's no touching. Kids with their clinching or grinding, they keep touching like upper and uh, lower teeth, which make like more pressure on the joint, make the more tension on the muscle. Uh, physical therapy is a good option for the uh, children. Behavioral therapy, especially if the kids have any problems with uh, like any psychological problems, you may send the patient to the psychiatrist. Uh, prescription medication, some cases, if doesn't work, if the uh, physical therapy doesn't work, a closer splint is the good option. Uh, it's not fabricating or like using uh, fabrication. They may use like over-counter uh, mouth guard. Uh, it will help them, especially if they have like paroxysm or grinding uh, when they sleep. So the recommendation for, according to the American uh, Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, uh, they recommend comprehensive dental, uh, during the dental history uh, examination, you do TMJ history and assessment, especially at the first appointment. So you ask the patient, do you have any clicking? Do you hear any sound? in front of your ear when you open your mouth when you close do you have limited your uh, limited mouth opening can you open your mouth wide do you have any problems any pain when you do this uh, even when you do examination you ask the patient do you have any pain when you move your jaw laterally or open and uh, closing uh, if they have any problems ask any about previous trauma but it's recommended to have reversible therapy reversible therapy what i mentioned before like close uh, splint physical therapy all this uh, treatment Avoid a reversible, a reversible therapy. What does it mean? Uh, some of the dentists thinks, uh, think they, uh, if you do reduction of the occlusal, uh, occlusion, change the patient occlusion will make like even sides, uh, like right even with the left side. Uh, it's not recommended at all. Or if you do surgery for the uh, kids, uh, maybe some cases they need it, but it's like it's very low number of these cases. And also if you do braces or ortho treatment, not as ortho treatment, but for TMJ problems treatments, is not recommended at all. So avoid a reversible therapy. Uh, if you want to do imaging, imaging it's for some cases. Uh, if the patient has recent trauma, or patient has facial asymmetry, for example, patient he said or he, their parents say uh, their occlusion changed. Uh, their occlusion changed, like they bite on one side, uh, one side recently or when they open, it's shifting to the right or to the left. So you may do a panorama at the beginning. If you feel any crevitus, bone to bone, or if you start any treatment, like physical therapy treatment, and is patient not responding to this treatment, you may do uh, imaging. Uh, then you can refer the patient to other specialty, like oral medicine or facial pain uh, for other uh, evaluation. So the last part of uh, my lecture is the salivary gland uh, disorder. As I mentioned, the most common uh, uh, cases encountered in, uh, as a salivary gland is the mucosal and the oral, the floor of the mouth mucosal, which is called frannula. 
Uh, I think most of you have seen these cases. It's asymptomatic swelling, of the oral cavity uh, caused by or disruption of the flow of the saliva from the manual or from the major salivary gland. The mucosal, uh, it's usually like dome shape, non tender, fluctuating when you press on it, uh, uh, non blanchable on applying pressure. This is how we differentiate between mucosal or ranula and the vascular lesion. The vascular lesions, when you have a glass and you press on it, it will like blanch, it will disappear. This is some of the diagnosis. If you see this mucosal like unusual presentation of these uh, uh, swellings, uh, size uh, usually it's up to four centimeters. Um, superficial mucosal, it looks like blue, dull bluish, but uh, if it's deep on the like deeper the mucosa, you will see like the normal covering mucosa. Uh, the same thing with the ranula, but the ranula it looks like more uh, bigger than uh, mucosal, and it's in the floor of the mouth. Uh, so the ranula mucosal uh, have the occurrence uh, on teenagers and young adults, and most of the cases they say they say patient is getting bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller. Uh, size of the mucosal, most of the cases we will see it. Uh, we, we will see it as we see here this the picture on the uh, uh, like the lower lip because of the trauma. The patient may bite their uh, lips but we can see this at a soft palate, retromoral area and the tongue, especially the ventral side of the tongue. Uh, ranula, usually, as you see here, it's the floor of the mouth. So the most common etiology, this is the most common, it's called extravasation. What happened during the trauma, there is like a disruption of the flow of the secretion of the saliva, so it's redirected somewhere else. So the mucus and makes like extravasation and accumulation in the surrounding tissue. And the other cause is the uh, it's less common, but it may have been especially with the uh, ranula. It's called retention type when the patient has yellow lip or tumor, which obstructs the uh, uh, the opening or the canal of the salivary gland. So we will see ranula or uh, mucosal. So how do we evaluate or manage this? Diagnosis is usually clinical, usually not mistaken with other uh, lesions. Um, we can do imaging, uh, imaging. Uh, we can do imaging for some cases, uh, especially if we need to exclude any differential, uh, any other problems. For example, ranula, some cases it looks like dermoid cyst or epidermoid cyst. So we may need to do like CT scan, uh, determine the cause. If you don't know the cause, like if it's not straightforward, most of the cases it's straightforward. Or if you have huge lesion and you need to see like the extension of the swelling, so uh, you can do the imaging studies. Um, for management of these cases, mucosal usually ruptured uh, spontaneously by itself, but if it's continue, uh, like persist, with surgical excision, remove it with the uh, main or salivary gland, the involved uh, affected salivary gland, to uh, lower the risk of recurrence. Uh, other treatments uh, reported using CO2 laser, uh, cryosurgery, electrosurgery as well. For the ranula, the same thing, we can use uh, multiplication or removal of the lesion and remove the uh, salivary gland, uh, the affected salivary gland uh, as well. Okay, so this case I saw in uh, my clinic. Uh, she's four years old, a girl. She came with this lesion. Uh, it looks like a deep mucosal. We just remove it in the clinic and biopsy it. Uh, so it's like mucosal. And you see the result like after seven days, it's, uh, it may uh, come back again because there is a recurrence rate. But the patient now it's more than like six months and she is uh, free of the, this swelling. Uh, thank you for listening, and if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for the interesting topic. Kindly, if you have any questions, you can write them down in the chat box. While we wait for the questions, I would like to ask Dr. Ahmed. I face the situation a lot in the clinic. Also, I get this question a lot by parents who are bothered by the proxism of their children. And uh, the proxism, as you know, affects the teeth function eventually. So as you know, one of the options to manage proxism is Botox injection for the masticatory muscles. 
My question for you, doctor, is it possible to use this technique with children? Is it safe? Okay, good question, doctor. So uh, one of the options that we manage adult with the proxism, we use uh, Botox injections directly to the muscle of mastication, but yeah. in, uh, in uh, children is not uh, safe. Well, that's what is mentioned in the literature and we don't use it usually. And it's not recommended to be used in children. So I do not recommend that in children based on what is written in literature. Okay. Uh, doctor, what about patients who present with the present to the clinic with recurrent abscess ulcer? Uh, can it be due to a nutritional deficiency? I've read one systematic review recommending vitamin B, um, prescribing vitamin B for patients with recurrent uh, ulcers. Can we prescribe vitamin B for children as well? Uh, so yes, we can prescribe it, especially for these cases that idiopathic. We don't know the cause. Patients have like all the lab testing is normal, no systemic disorders, uh, no parent has any problems with the like no recurrent ulcers. Yes, we can use even topically or even the supplement, uh, but we need to keep monitoring these uh, uh, kids. Like we can give the patient and monitor like after three months to see if any changes or any improvement. Okay, we can prescribe vitamin B complex or a specific type of vitamin B. Usually they prescribe vitamin B complex, but lower doses, like children uh, doses, uh, uh, but it's like the B complex, not like B12 or uh, B6, no, yeah. just B complex. But okay. it's, uh, it's not proven uh, well, like it's not well studied in literature. Yes, I, 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 the systematic review in 2012, tw uh, sorry, 2021, uh, I think uh, on adults. Uh, but not on children. Yes, and and, and, and adults, but uh, most of the treatment in children, it's uh, investigating the predisposing factors and managing the symptoms like uh, topical. Okay. Uh, one of the audience is asking, can mucosils appear on the buccal mucosa? Sorry, what's the question? Can we what? Can mucosils appear on the buccal mucosa? One of the audience Tons. is asking. Can mucosil oh. appear on the buccal mucosa? Oh yes, yeah, uh, mucosil. Yes, mucosil. We can uh, we can see it in any part of the uh, the or mucosa, but the most of the cases we see it on the uh, lower lip, and also we see we saw some cases on the uh, palate, the tongue, the uh, yes, the tongue, the ventral side of the tongue. So you may see it in any part of the uh, oral mucosa. Okay, uh, we have a question from Dr. Landbera. At what age would you recommend a hard occlusal splint? And until what age a soft one? That's the part one of the question. And does the hard one prevent the growth? So usually we don't recommend the hard one that we do for adults if the patient is still teething. The patient has like teeth growing because you okay. will make impression for these kids and uh, like it's ideal size for their teeth at that moment. But if there's any other tooth growing or uh, for example, teeth molar, it will like will not fit uh, anymore. So usually we save this option until the patient like after 18 years old, we can uh, do the hard one. Okay, 18 years old. Uh, one question, it's what's the management of clenching in medically compromised children? or the um, mentally challenged children? Yes, yeah, so um, usually for this, uh, there is no treatment we can do for these uh, kids unless we manage their predisposing factor. Uh, some cases, uh, they have like idiopathic, there's no reason for proxism or their clinching. So we try to uh, manage these symptoms by giving the patient the mouth guard. If they are adult, we give them like Botox injection, uh, some of these is their cognitive behavior therapy, like uh, okay. psychological uh, evaluation for these cases. Uh, um, but if like different from the uh, medically compromised patients, maybe the if you give the patient medication or an anxiolytic medication, not as prescribing, but I mean the psychologist, the psychiatrist, maybe the okay. dose is different based on the uh, adverse effect. Uh, but we can use an anxiolytic medication, especially for these uh, kids who have like an anxiety or uh, any psychological problems. Yes. Um, 
One question is what are the choices to treat paroxysm in children, in your opinion? Uh, what are what? The choices to treat paroxysm in children. Yes, that's what I mentioned in my slide. It's uh, if there is any cause, you have we have to take like a, a good uh, medical history and review of system, a good history from the patient. Uh, if there is any cause, like any uh, like psychological or social or psychiatric problems, we have to manage this case. If you suspect something psychological and patient did not tell you, you may refer the patient to the specialist, to the okay. psychologist or psychiatrist. Uh, some kids, uh, they have this paroxysm when they are teething, when they have pain in their mouth. So they right. tend to grind or clench their teeth uh, at night, yeah. but this will subside when they have like full teeth. Uh, so you may yeah. see this or, or ask the patient if they have any pain in other part of their body. Uh, for example, in adults, yeah. they have uh, people with the chronic back pain or any like fibromyalgia or any problems. They yeah. have like uh, more paroxysm when they sleep or uh, even uh, awake uh, when they are awake. So it's more about uh, digging about underlying causes with children, not the real treatment. Yes, yes, of course. But keep yeah. in mind, there is some kids they have no any other problems and they have like just paroxysm. Okay, so uh -huh. we just keep uh, uh, like keep like saving the teeth, saving uh, the problem not to progress to an advanced like. Uh, making like flattening of the uh, the condyle, uh, breaking the teeth because we saw some cases like they have broken tooth because of the paroxysm. So we yes. try to keep the yes. patient uh, uh, like uh, avoiding all of these problems. Yes. Okay. One uh, one audience is asking about using topical local anesthetic gel for the ulcers in children. Uh, I mentioned that in one of the slides, it's not recommended because of the safety. There is no clinical trials uh, trying this topical in kids. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's, it's not recommended. There is no sufficient uh, data recommending this. Okay. Um, one question is a case that I encountered in the clinic, a patient with geographic tongue, and he presented with exacerbation of the geographic tongue after COVID-19 infection. So um, viral infections do exacerbate the geographic tongue. Interesting case. I haven't, uh, like, I haven't uh, seen any case uh, aggravated or caused by COVID-19, but it's an interesting case. It's a good case to publish. Yes, but it is uh, it, it, it's usually due to the viral infection. That's my own. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, no, uh, it, as I mentioned also in my lecture, it's unknown cause. Most of the oh. geographic tongue unknown cause. Yeah, so maybe viral infection like COVID-19 aggravate that and maybe the patient has the ge geographic tongue even before and they just notice their lesion when they like when they have the infection, yeah. they try to look their throat and they say, uh, oh, I have geographic tongue. They may have it even yeah. before the COVID-19. Yeah, that's what I said to them. Exactly. Thank you, yes. Dr. Ahmed. Thank you for the presentation, for answering all the questions. So on behalf of the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry, we'd like to present our appreciation for Dr. Ahmed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. And I would like to remind our audience that today's session, along with the previous session, will be available on the Society's YouTube channel, along with the website as well sspd-sa.org thank you all for being with us today see you in the next webinar inshallah thank you dr maram thank you for having thank me tonight you. sure thanks for being with us you are welcome have a good night you too take care everyone <laughs>